All right, so my name is Kate Wexell, and I'm an ambassador from the state of Missouri. So next, we're going to introduce our fantastic speaker that's following him up. So Nolan Gray is the research director for California YIMBY and an expert in urban land use regulation. He's the author of Arbitrary Lines, How Zoning Broke the American City and How to Fix It, and has also been published in The Atlantic, Bloomberg City Lab, and The Guardian. Awesome. And yes, he lives in Los Angeles, California, and is originally from Lexington, Kentucky. Ooh, those Kentucky hugs, that bourbon. But we have to give this man a warm hug. Please help us welcome to the stage, Nolan. I've been asked to say, if, if you're here for Utah Blues Fest, um, I think you're in the wrong room. I'm, uh, I'm about to talk for 20 minutes about zoning. Um, in all seriousness, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks to ACC for having me out. Thanks to Young Voices for helping me to be here. Um, let's take stock just very quickly. Uh, who in this room would consider themselves a zoning expert? Okay, we got some zoning experts. Okay, you guys can leave. Um, <laughs> Who in this room knows what zoning is, but you, you, know, you, know, you know what it does vaguely? Okay, good, good. And who in here uh, lives a happy, normal, well-adjusted life, and you don't know anything about zoning? Oh, not that many people, okay, good. Well, so um, I'm gonna be t talking about zoning today, I'm gonna be explaining what it is, and I'm gonna be making the case why this is one of these areas where conservative, libertarian, free market solutions really has enormous value. Um, Let's level set here for a minute. The American city is kind of a hot mess right now on almost any possible margin. Um, of course, over the course of the uh, pandemic, home prices uh, surged dramatically all across the country. You know, and I'm coming from a place like California where we're used to talking about housing affordability as a problem. You know, when I would go to a place like a Montana or a Georgia, I had to convince them, hey, this is an issue, I promise, this is, this is not just California not knowing how to govern itself, this is gonna be an issue here. And you had to make that case. Over the last two or three years, nobody has that illusion. Everybody knows this is one of the number one problems facing our country, especially right here in the Mountain West, where increasingly, not just you know Californians can't move here, but kids who are born and raised here don't have a path to homeownership. Nurses, teachers, Firefighters don't have a path to owning a home or even sustainably renting one in their own community. We've seen massive dislocations as Americans have moved around the country in search of affordable housing. California has essentially exported its housing crisis all across the Mountain West, and you're feeling that today. So many of the rules, too, that made California unaffordable are on the books here in places like Utah, across the Mountain West, across currently affordable places like the South. And if we don't act now, we're going to have coastal soil housing crises be a permanent feature all across the country. And what's our response to this? Of course, everybody knows we need to be building a lot more housing, but the only way we know how to build housing in this country is by permanently sprawling out. And as so many folks in here, I know it's important to you, this does not necessarily look like stewardship of our natural lands. We need to have a pattern of growth that actually allows us to build the housing that we need without necessarily consuming endless amounts of natural areas. But again, the only thing we know how to build is this. Does anybody want to live in this? I mean, look at the guy walking in the median. You think he's happy right now? <laughs> he's trying to find Blues Fest, okay? And he's lost. <laughs> There's no bus. Um, if you're out there, it's okay. Um, this is not an accident, okay? This is not a natural formation. This, this pattern of, of unaffordability and unsustainability is not an accident. In fact, it's the result of carefully designed local rules authorized by the state government. Those rules are zoning ordinances. These are state delegated powers to local governments, which allow local governments to divide the city up into zoning districts. And for every zoning district say, these are the permitted uses, this is the permitted density. Sounds inoffensive, right? But who here has played SimCity? Any SimCity people here? Okay, come on. Not, don't get too feisty here. No city skyline stuff. Um, <laughs> most people know about these rules, right, in a very theoretical way. You know, yeah, we need rules that separate 
industry, from residences. We need rules that make sure that growth is coordinated with infrastructure. The problem is that the zoning rules we have on the books in most U.S. cities today go so much further than that and have essentially locked our cities in a straitjacket that has put us on, unavoidably on that path to unaffordability and unsustainability. In places where I come from, you know, uh, ACC messaged me about six months ago and they said, hey, you guys have figured out housing affordability in California. Can you come out here and explain to us how we did it? Um, that's a joke. Um, places like where I'm coming from in Los Angeles, it is actually illegal to build anything other than a single family home in something like 70 to 80 percent of the city. If a property owner said, hey, look, rents are going up, I think I can make a little bit of money if I take my home and turn it into maybe two units, three units, four units. In Los Angeles, as in almost every city in the United States, it's illegal to do that. It's illegal to do that. The only thing you can legally build in so much of Los Angeles, as in almost every American city, is a single family home. And there's nothing wrong with single family homes, but what the government is doing in this case is it's robbing people of the right to use their property as they like, it's robbing people of the right to add the housing that our communities need, and as land prices keep going up, the only thing you're gonna get is increasingly expensive homes. Where we don't just make housing outright illegal to build altogether, there's a thicket of local regulations that say, you're not allowed to build a home that's more affordable. So I'm gonna use a little bit of planning jargon here. If you need to go uh, get some more coffee, please do that now. There's also cheesecake, by the way. Um, we have rules like minimum lot sizes, even in contexts where we don't typically think of zoning as being particularly restrictive. In places like Texas, that say, if you can't afford a single family lot of 9,000 square feet, you don't get to own a home here. We're essentially putting a price floor on housing that has nothing to do with health and safety, nothing to do with those original nice sim city concepts that we thought motivated these rules. Other rules in cities have a similar effect where they essentially mandate you're not allowed to have an apartment unless you have two parking spaces. Now, of course, a lot of people are gonna want parking, nothing wrong with that, but the government doesn't actually let developers make that choice. It doesn't let the market make that choice about how much parking is necessary and appropriate. So you get beautiful developments like this. We call this a Dallas donut. Dallas Donut, it's a apartment building surrounding a giant parking garage. Um, very nice, any Dallas people in the room? All right, you gotta lower your parking requirements. Um, for let's say a family in a two bedroom, small, modest, multifamily, two bedroom unit, an additional two parking spaces is actually requiring that they consume twice as much space. And again, we're not even giving them the choice about that matter. If those parking requirements mandate the developer build a parking garage or a giant parking lot, that can increase the cost of maybe a new two-bedroom condo by $30,000, $50,000. And then, of course, there are a whole bunch of rules that just regiment the way that our lives naturally work. Here's on the image on the uh, left here. This is from D.C. Anybody lived in D.C. here? D.C. people? Okay. Um, you see these all over... Uh, this is from Capitol Hill, I used to live here. You see these everywhere. That's a pretty funny looking house, isn't it? I mean, most, most homes don't have like showroom windows. That's because it was actually uh, formerly a corner commercial use. At one time, that might have been a corner grocery, that might have been a corner barbershop, a corner doctor's office. But today, under current zoning rules that say, well, no, residences are gonna go here and commercial's gonna go there. Did I get cut off? Okay. Residences are gonna go here, commercial's gonna go there. That has to be residences. And the only place that you can go shop is if you get in your car and go to a strip mall. Again, some people might want to live this way. I mean, I grew up this way. I, I know a lot of my friends and family live this way. But the thing about the current American city is we don't give people choice. We force them into the pattern of development that is most wasteful of land and has the largest impact on the climate. And then, of course, layered on top of all of these rules are a thicket of rules, in many cases, theoretically based on environmental concerns, things like CEQA. CEQA. If you don't know what CEQA is, I'm going to spare you and not define it for you. Uh, ask somebody at your table. We have these rules, environmental report rules, that say if you want to build infill housing, if you want to build maybe an apartment building in an existing neighborhood, if you want to build so for shops, if you want to build in our existing communities where maybe a person who lives there might be able to walk or ride a bike or take a bus or take a train, we're going to make it really, really, really hard for you. But if you want to go build more sprawl, cool. Yeah, sorry we inconvenienced you. Here's your permit. Then of course out of this we get nimbyism, nimby. Who knows what nimby is? Yell it out if you know it. Okay, boo, oh I'm switching mics here. Hello, okay, very good. What was that, nimby, what does nimby stand for? 
Is anybody here in NIMBY? Okay, good. So we're all sold here. What we get is a politics where an unrepresentative group of people can show up at these public hearings and deny everything. Of course, folks in the uh, energy space know about NIMBY all too well. You want to build anything, you want to build, you want to put some solar panels in, you want to put some windmills in, uh, you know, God forbid you want to build some uh, transmission lines, NIMBY. All of that tracks onto housing, makes it very hard to build, especially in our higher opportunity areas and especially areas near jobs. Okay, is everybody depressed now? Good? Dep the cheesecake is still back there if you need it. I come bearing, I think, very good news, I hope. It doesn't have to be this way. As I said at the top of the, uh, top of the talk, this is one of these areas where I think conservative, libertarian, free market principles, letting people do what they like with their property can actually do the most good. And we're already seeing a groundswell of activism around this issue, and I hope folks will feel motivated to join that movement at the end of this talk. Yep, that was a fun transition. Okay, all over the country we're seeing cities as they reckon with housing affordability and sustainable growth patterns say, you know what, a lot of these rules don't make sense. They don't reflect our current planning values. All across the country, it's almost, it's almost, I had to turn off my Google alert for this because I'm getting too many news articles about this. Cities are saying, hey, we're gonna stop mandating the construction of acres of parking or towers of parking garages. Of course, I'm from Lexington, Kentucky. I'm sure everybody was glued to this most important news story of the year so far. Even my hometown scrapped their parking requirements. Handing it back to the market to figure out how much actual parking is necessary. And it turns out that when we let people make that choice, maybe they build a little bit less of it. Other cities, here's a good example, like Houston, are saying, yeah, we're gonna stop mandating really large lots that waste land and that price middle and working class families out of home ownership. In 1998, the city of Houston, unzoned, but they have a lot of zoning like rules. I'll talk about that in a minute. Said, you know what? We can live with a lower minimum lot size. We could live if we drop our minimum lot size from 5,000 square feet to 1,400 square feet. And you know what happened when they legalized it in 1999? The sky didn't fall. 25,000 units were built that were significantly more affordable, keeping people near transit and job centers and reducing the need for endless exurban sprawl. Of course, we don't always get reform at the local level. Remember those NIMBYs? Yeah, those NIMBYs are often kind of in control at the local level. And this is where we need states to come in. As I said earlier, zoning is a state delegated power to local governments, and it's incumbent on states to intervene when local governments misuse or abuse those powers. Here in California, where I, I work, California Yumbi, uh, we've done some very exciting things to restore property rights and to make it easier for people to build. One of the most successful examples of this is the statewide legalization of accessory dwelling units. Anybody know what an ADU is? It's on the screen. Okay, pop quiz, good. Accessory dwelling, granny flats, mother-in-law units, casitas, a little bit of Spanish. Um, these are essentially extra new little units that might go in a garage or a basement or an attic. Historically, homeowners would install them all the time, maybe to have an additional source of income, maybe to provide a place for mom and dad to live uh, as they age, maybe to have a place for young adult children to live while they save up for a home. What we've seen since California restored the right of property owners statewide to build ADUs is an ADU building boom. Today, because of state protections of property rights on this narrow issue of zoning, now about one in three to one in four of the units permitted in Los Angeles is an ADU. These were homes that were literally illegal to build before 2016. In the state as a whole, it's something like a quarter of all new homes built are accessory dwelling units. This is, this is really the power of very small reforms to a policy like zoning. That's, that's literally tens of thousands of people who get a home because we managed to roll back one stupid regulation. It's not a very nice word, stupid, but it is kind of stupid. The beautiful thing about this area, too, is that I talked about California there. This is not a partisan or an, even a particularly ideological issue. One of the things that really excites me about this issue is that yeah, you know, progressives might talk in terms of sustainability or racial equity. Conservatives might talk in terms of property rights or, you know, starter homes for families. But they end up supporting exactly the same types of policies. You know, so one of the biggest wins we've had on a lot of these reforms this year was in Montana. You had big sky, rock-ribbed Republicans advocating for the same types of policies as 
dyed in the wool progressive Democrats from the Bay Area. How many issues like that do you get? This is a really, really special issue. Montana especially, you know, it was funny, I went there to speak in Montana, and I'm getting ready to testify, and my, my colleague there, um, he's like, hey man, I'm gonna get my testimony, and I'm gonna beat up really hard on California. I'm gonna beat up on how much you guys botched your housing affordability crisis. And I'm like, please, whatever you have to do to pass this bill. He was essentially making the case that in Montana, as in a state like Utah, across the Mountain West, across the South, if you want a California or a New York City housing crisis, just do absolutely nothing. Just sit. The rules are already so strict that it's almost impossible to build the types of housing that your communities need. But if you want to avoid a California-style housing crisis, now is the time for reform. I've talked about the local level, I've talked about the state level. There's also a lot of reform even coming at the federal level. Some of these bills have unsubtle names, like uh, Build More Housing Near Transit Act. Does anyone know what that one does? <laughs> we have the Yes in My Backyard Act. Even the federal government is getting involved in setting up incentives for local governments and state governments to contend with these rules, to seriously consider them, to consider the rules and regulations that are holding back the type of infill housing production that we need to keep our communities affordable and sustainable. In the book, I talk a little bit about Houston. Houston is fascinating. It's not an all-purpose planning model by any means. They do have very good uh, Vietnamese barbecue fusion cuisine, which is very special to me. Um, but Houston is also unique because they're the only major city that doesn't have zoning. And they don't have zoning because they're the only major city that actually put it to a vote, that asked local residents, hey, do you want this thing? And on three occasions, voters rejected it. Now, Houston's not an all-purpose planning model, but to an incredible degree, I think, their lack of zoning actually makes the city more adaptable, flexible, uh, and uh, sustainable over time. In Houston, unlike in almost any American city, you can take a single-family home and turn it into two or three townhouses that are gonna be able to keep folks who grew up there in town and are gonna be able to accommodate newcomers. You can take that old strip mall that all of our communities have one that's sitting 50% empty, it's never gonna fill up again, and turn it into a five-over one with a Whole Foods. To a unique degree, their, their lack of rules regimenting our cities and saying for every single parcel in the city, this is the allowed land use and this is the allowed density. They didn't do that and what have they got? They've got a city that's actually one of the fastest growing cities in the country. That's a city, I give this talk to folks in places like California and the Northeast and they say, well, we have nothing to learn from, from New York or from Houston. And I say to them, where do you think your working class families are moving to? Where do you think your middle class families are moving to? Because middle class families are not moving from Houston to LA. They're moving the other way around. And it's because to almost unique degree among major American cities, Houston is adding the housing and adding the housing near jobs uh, that the community needs. Okay, uh, I, I've been told to give an action item at the end of my talks. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, what can you do? There's all the words here. Look at all the words on the slide. That's bad, That's bad PowerPoint design. Um, First, get involved in this movement. I've teased it a little bit here, but what we are living through right now is a moment where folks are passionate about these issues. Not just young people. Young people are realizing we don't have a path to homeownership in our communities. Pull up Zillow, if you don't believe me, maybe you've been in a home since you know, 20, 30 years, pull up Zillow and put in the income that you would need to be able to afford a home. Young people are realizing they don't have a path to homeownership, they're spending more than half of their money on rent, they're getting activated on this. But also, folks tangentially affected by it. Maybe folks who are beneficiaries of the housing shortage, maybe their home has gone up in value, but they're realizing my young adult children don't have any home that they can afford within two or three hours of me. I encounter this so much in California. Folks say the only place my kid can afford a home is to move to Nevada or Utah or Montana to export the California housing crisis and go price someone else out of their community. Get involved in your state and local chapters that are moving on these issues. Second, Talk to your elected officials and your planners. Um, we survey people, we poll people. Consistently, the, num the number one and number two issue that they say they're concerned about are housing related. One is housing affordability, and the second is homelessness. And those things are intimately connected. We know that the higher the average rent for a two bedroom unit and the higher, the lower the vacancy rate, the higher the homelessness rate. Elected officials go back to their communities and this is all they hear about. They're looking for answers. You can be the one to go to them and say, hey, what are we doing on zoning reform? 
What are we doing to remove the rules and regulations that don't reflect our current values, that put our cities and communities on a path to permanent unaffordability and unsustainability? Third, we need people to build the housing. We need people to build it, right? We legalize housing at California EMB, we work with elected officials, but we need folks to actually go out and build the housing. Whatever stage of this process of change you think you can do the most good at, start doing it, because this is our generation's issue. I wanna stress this, I think this is really a once in a generation opportunity to make a huge impact, to roll back rules and regulations that ruin or significantly lower people's quality of life and that put our cities on a path to permanent unsustainability. Um, if you wanna learn more, I have a book. It's on Amazon, Bookshop. Uh, if you have one here, I'll sign it. Thanks so much, uh, and I'm, I think we have 30 seconds for questions. No questions? Uh, thank you.